verses in 1 Corinthians 14, it says, For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God, for no one understands, but in his spirit he speaks mysteries. Right, so you, when you pray in tongues, when you sing in tongues, you are speaking mysteries. Now, why would you need to speak mysteries? Why don't we just speak in English? Because sometimes God wants to do something and he, 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 he's kept it hidden from the enemy. And if you speak it out in tongues, it remains a secret. The devil does not understand your tongue. When you're singing in tongues, he doesn't understand what you're singing. You could just be singing praises to God, but you could also be singing forth God's plan. And the devil doesn't know anything about it, doesn't know how to counter it, doesn't know how to react. So don't ever think that you're wasting your time singing in the Spirit, right? Part of it is to get us over into a realm, into a space where God can speak to us. If we wanted to have a dancing exposite, ex exposite, no, no, no. The word is not coming to me. Exhibit. Exposition. Exhibit. Yeah. Exhibition. Thank you. I'm like, well, he was not there. Um, in the middle of the living room, what would we have to do? Move all this. We would have to move things to make room. Part of what singing in the spirit does is it makes room for God to be and to say. Mm -hmm. If our living room is filled with furniture, we have no room to do the things, such as dance, three somersaults, do cartwheels. But if we move everything out of the way, it gives space to do those things. And sometimes what we do in church is we fill up all the space in our services. Mm -hmm. We fill up all the space with, okay, we've got to do this, and then we have to do announcements, and then we've got to do that, we've got to talk about this thing, and then we've got to do baby dedication, we've got to do baptism, we've got to do this, and we leave no space for God, and we make no room for Him to just move. And even if He doesn't do anything major, even if there isn't, you know, a pyrotechnics display in the middle of the room, we still made room for God. We let him be God in the middle of our midst. And we told him that our agenda was not more important than his desire for that service. And that's important. Because as God, God, is, is he the reason we came together? If he's God, and the Holy Spirit, part of the Trinity, is also God, then we have every duty to make room for him, to make space for him, to be God into our, in our midst, to be Lord in that church service. If that means that all we have is the sweet presence of the Lord, that's enough. And it's, it's a good thing. Right? We need to be very comfortable with the presence of God. But if God wants to make a display, do a sign, do a wonder, heal someone, Restore someone's missing limb. If he wants to replace someone's internals that are having problems. If he, if he wants to, to, to do things, we've given him the space and the room and the permission to do so. Because we've made that room. That's why we sing like that. It's because we ask him, come, come have your way. Come have your way in, our, in, in this place. Come have your way in here. And we're not going to... Can you move so that your sister can sit, please? Thank you. Um, we're not going to take up all of the space for what we think needs to happen. Because sometimes what we think needs to happen is it God's agenda. That's not what he thinks. And not that the things that you're wanting to do are bad things. It's just sometimes they're not what God is doing right now. And I think we need to be more concerned with what God is doing right now than our plan.
blue light flashing or whatever. I'm just turning on. Okay. Is the light still on? It should flash blue on the top. So the Lord has, it was just in the middle of, of the worship, but it was like just stuck inside me, this and it's a message that we all can work on being more conscious of. And to remember as we go about our lives to, to remember what he's done and why he did it. In chapter in uh, Second Corinthians chapter five. Verse seventeen. If any man be in Christ, that's right. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things passed away, and behold, new things have come. That's what my translation says. All things have passed away, and all things are made new. So for you guys, like you guys never went out and lived like a heathen. You were out in the world partying and doing drugs. You weren't out there sleeping around and being being a, a creep. Duplicit. You were not, right? So sometimes we 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 look at these scriptures. That's the person we think of as being a new creature. Those people that come to the Lord and it is obvious. Wow, that's a major change. You're no longer an alcoholic. Wow, that's a major change. You're no longer on drugs. Wow, that's a major change. You know, you changed your entire wardrobe to be more godly because you used to dress like somebody who, who was a prostitute. Right? Like, we look at those people and we're just so impressed by their testimony and their witness because, you know, they did stuff. But when you're born into a Christian family and you're born into to the church and you've loved the Lord since you were little and you got born again little and you got baptized in the Holy Ghost little and you've never really done anything sometimes we forget that this scripture applies to us too I know that for myself I used to think that my testimony wasn't a very powerful testimony because in comparison to the people who you know man I was with the kings and I was out doing drugs and I was with a different girl every night and you know, their lives were just a big, fat, messed up, weird thing. And they come to the Lord and it's this miraculous transformation. And now they're in church all the time. And, you know, you know, God really did a massive work in their lives. I always thought that those were the more powerful testimonies than mine. Mine was just kind of weenie in comparison because I've never done those things. Right? Yeah, but there's a scripture that says... You believe because you have seen me, but blessed are those who believe without seeing me. It's true. It's true. But this is what I learned, is that it is almost more miraculous for someone to be raised in a church, to be in the middle of all of this, to be in church every Sunday and every Wednesday, to be at prayer meetings, to be there on, on church cleaning days, on work days, raised up, grown up in it, and become an adult, and never, ever backslide, never, ever go and live like that. That God keeps you in the middle of a perverse generation. That you never have to taste of those things to see that they're bad. That you never have to go and be, be a bar crawler to understand that being a drunkard is a bad thing. 
that is a miraculous thing that God is able to preserve you, that you're able to get married and, 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 and be pure when you get married and to, to live your life for Jesus and not just come out of the church and be like, yeah, okay, yeah, I'm a Christian because I've met those who were raised in church and they're not on fire for Jesus. Mm-hmm. But for God to to plant a fire in your soul and for you to never have the taste of sin, that you're a new creature in Christ, even though you weren't a, a, a messed up thing to begin with. You're still a new creature in Christ. Old things, those things that you could have done have passed away. And the things that you're going to do now in God are new. They're new, even though you never tasted of the other. It's still true. It's still a powerful testimony for you to be raised in a church and never have to taste of sin. To never have to drink the bitter dregs of the world. Because I know people that were raised in church and then went out and screw themselves up in the world and they're like oh my gosh I wish I'd never done it mm-hmm. right because they thought that they needed to they thought that somehow life was going to be more purposeful or meaningful or they were missing out on something because mm-hmm. they'd never slept around or partied or done drugs no nope, you aren't missing out on anything if we had a pigsty in our backyard you remember going to the fair do you remember going to the pig barn Remember when we saw those piglets? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Do you remember the piglets? Oh. What does the pig barn smell like? Pig and mud. It stinks, doesn't it? Even when you go to the cow barn, the cow barn does not smell like that. It smells like cows, but it does smell like pigs. Pigs have their own perfume. Mm-hmm. It is not a pleasant perfume. It's a nasty perfume. It's gross, right? So if we raised That's pigs... Clean. Huh? The pig barn is clean. The pig barn is clean too. Like they're not, you know, most pigs they leave them they leave the mud to wallow in because pigs' uh, skin is very sensitive, and they can get sunburn and stuff like that. So they wallow to protect themselves. They cool themselves down and put a coat of mud on them so they don't get sunburned. Right? It's part of the reason pigs wallow. But they poop in it, and then they're wallowing in their poop. So this whole thing just it stinks. It has a very particular aroma. So if you were raised on a farm and you were raised in doing the things of the farm if you thought that it was better for you to experience the pig pen than to stand outside the pig pen and be able to understand that the pig pen is a nasty yucky place so you decided to go in and dive into the mire with the pigs and roll around in it gross right like you don't have to go roll with the pigs to understand that that muck is not something you want to be intimate with like i don't want that up my nose i don't want it in my my fingers i don't want it in my elbow pit like gross right they clean up those those places so that it's not so nasty but that's what people sometimes do they're raised in the church and rather than understanding from afar that that pig pen is gross and it is not something that i need to participate in to understand it they go and dive in, and they make a mess of their lives. And then they come out and go, <laughs> I don't know what happened. It's gross, and it's everywhere. And, uh, and then they have to come to the Lord and repent and get cleansed of all of that stuff, you know, so they get the stink of pig off of them. Right? It is good for us to understand that what we have in Christ is precious and it is wonderful and it is worth living the, our whole life for Jesus and on fire for Jesus. Mm-hmm. Not just to be in the church and sit there like a lump and okay, I'm here, but to be fervent for the Lord, to be passionate for the Lord. Right? Now, some people have gone out into the world and have done things. And so, I mean, like, I know that for myself, there I've noticed fleshy inclinations. Like, if I let my flesh go that direction, it would be yucky. Mm-hmm. 
front. Like some people, uh, you know, their tendency would be towards alcohol, to get drunk. Some people, their tendency would be to be really mean towards others, right? So simply because I'm in Christ doesn't mean I get to indulge my flesh. I'm in Christ, so it doesn't matter how I treat people. No, it matters. How I treat people matters. Whether or not I'm out in the bar matters. Because if I have the name of Christ upon my lips, then I need to make sure that I am living a life that is worthy of Christ. Right? I want to take you to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 9. So 1 Corinthians 6, 9. It says, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Okay, something you need to know. Unrighteous people are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Why would he say that? Apparently it's pretty, pretty easy to deceive sometimes. Because it's, you can be deceived. So we as believers need to know that if we're going to go out into this sort of thing, we are in a place of deception. We're in a place that the devil has our ear and is speaking into it, and we're letting him. We are being deceived. Is it not the time? Huh? I think the battery died, so okay. I just unplugged it. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators nor idolaters. What's an idolater? One who follows idols. One who worships idols. So, no, we don't necessarily always in today's society have golden statues in the corner of our room where we have incense sticks in front of them. Some people still do, but not everybody does. And simply because you don't have a shiva in the corner that you're worshiping doesn't mean you don't have an idol. Mm -hmm. Your idol could be your phone. Your idol could be football. Your idol could be your spouse or your children. Your idol could be your job. Your idol could be hunting. Your idol could be fishing. Your idol could be your boat. Your idol could be bowling. Your idol could be bowling. Your idol could be Legos. Your idol could, your be, idol could be makeup. Your idol could be TV. Your idol could be the television. Idols come in many forms, and an idol is simply something that has a place of, of preeminence above God. Like, you put that before God. Before you spend time with God, you're scrolling through Facebook. Before you spend time with God, you know, you're, you're worried about going hunting. You know, I'd rather watch football than go to church. Ooh, better watch that one because it's real super easy to slip over into idolatry. Yeah. All right. So fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate. That word effeminate is the word catamite in the Greek, and a catamite was a little boy that was sold in the Roman market for sex. It wasn't good. So, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers. What's a reviler? It's not a reveler. Yeah. Reviler. What does it mean to revile something? To do slander. To, to mock it and to, to hate it, yeah. Nor swindlers, what is, what's a swindler? Who's a, what, give me an, an example of a swindler. Swindler of somebody who cars away, right? That's a whittler. That's a whittler. Not a swindler. Swindler. If I swindle you, if I swindle you, it means that I'm cheating you. I am, I'm trying to get money out of you for something that maybe I shouldn't get money you money out of you for. I'm going to sell you this thing and tell you that it's super duper amazing and really it's not so I charge you much more than it's worth. I'm getting more for my product than I need to get for my product because my product is not what I am claiming it is. That's a swindler. So he's, he says these things, none of these people. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 
9, 10. 10 things he lists here. He says, will inherit the kingdom of God. Is that the end of it? No, he says, such were some of you. Now he's speaking to the church in Corinth. Corinth was a peculiar place. Corinth was built by Julius Caesar. Um, it was rebuilt by Julius Caesar. It was rebuilt right? by Julius Caesar because uh, either the, what was there had been destroyed or hadn't had a port there in a long time, but it was a good place for a port. So he built it and he dedicated it to Jesus. Aphrodite. Aphrodite was his patron goddess. Aphrodite is a Greek goddess. Um, and she's the goddess of love. But it's not the god kind of love. It's yucky. So Corinth was full, was, was pretty much populated by veterans of the Roman army. Sailors. Sailors. Mercenaries. And prostitutes. Mm -hmm. Lots and lots mm -hmm. of prostitutes. So that is the main populace of Corinth. Does that sound like a savory group? Like, wow, man, that's a bunch of upright citizens right there. Man, good, good lot of folk. I want to rub elbows with these people. I want to go to a party with them. Sounds like a city that should have been left abandoned. It, it, was, it was a gross group of folk. And as is evidenced by what is written here, fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, catamites, homosexuals, thieves, covetous, I want what you have. Not that I want one of what you have, like a similar thing. Like, I don't want to get a necklace similar to Sophie's. I want Sophie's necklace. I'm going to take Sophie's necklace. I covet Sophie's necklace. Covetous. Drunkards, revilers, and swindlers. That's who was in Corinth. That, that like, is a great description of who was in Corinth. But here is what Paul said. He says, such were some of you. He said, some of you were these things. You came into the church. You came into the faith. And you were these things. Those ten things defined you in some way, shape, or form. One or more of them defined you. But here's what he said. But you were washed. What does but mean in this particular instance? Forget what lies behind and look forward to what's ahead. But you were washed. But you were sanctified. But you were justified. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So here he's saying, forget your past. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what you once were. It doesn't matter how you once lived. What matters is that you're in Christ. What matters is that, is that you're a new creature. And those old things have passed away. And now your life is all new. And everything you do from this point on is a new thing, and it should be a thing that's in Christ. So as people that have walked in the church and have grown in the church, when we look at these things and there's this list of nasty, we should look at that and go, that is a list of things for me not to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. That is a list of things for me not to be. But more importantly... It is a list of things for me not to be judgmental towards other people about when they come into the church. But they've been born again. All of that is washed away. It is under the blood. It doesn't matter what they once were. It doesn't matter that they once were a prostitute. It doesn't matter that they once were a drug addict. It doesn't matter that they once were the biggest cheat known to mankind. They, they once were. Now they are a new creature in Christ. Mm -hmm. And now they are under the blood. Now they are washed, they are sanctified, and they are justified. They've been made just by the blood of Jesus in the eyes of God. They have been made holy by the blood of Jesus Christ, sanctified and set apart for him. And they've been washed of all of that. They came out of the pig muck, and God gave them a really big shower, and he scrubbed them super hard. Got it all out of their pores. There's not, a, there's not a bit of it left. So these are things that it's not that we don't need to know that they exist. We, we should know that they exist. But we should know that that should not define us as a believer. 
that as a believer, I am not supposed to be a fornicator. As a believer, I'm not supposed to be an idolater. Jesus Christ is my God, not football, not my boat, mm -hmm. not my kids. Jesus Christ is my God, not, not an illicit affair with somebody else's spouse. Mm -hmm. All right? That I'm not supposed to be behaving in a homosexual fashion. Mm -hmm. That is not me. That matter what I once were. I was that. I'm not that no more. That's what he's saying here. It doesn't matter what you once did. It doesn't matter how you once acted. What you engaged in. You are no longer that person. That man is dead. You have been buried with Christ in baptism. And you've been raised to newness of life. Yeah. Right? So we need to allow people to bury the corpses of their past. And not bring it up. Because I know that, I, I mean, I grew up in church, man. There are some nasty people in churches who will bring up anything and everything that anybody ever did. doesn't matter whether or not they repented of it. Well, you were once. And they just drag this stupid, nasty thing up and keep, it's like airing somebody's dirty laundry constantly. You peed the bed when you were six. You peed, see, I've got evidence. Here are the dirty sheets here. You peed the bed. Did they stink? Oh my gosh, you peed the bed. That's kind of like what they're doing with people. Instead of allowing them to grow as a believer in the Lord, to grow as a new creature in Christ, they keep dragging it up and, and, and airing it like it's something that needs to be said. We should not be doing that. Just like you wouldn't want somebody to go out and tell everybody about your, your peed on sheets. You would want yeah. someone to be discreet and for love to cover that multitude of sins. For love to be like, yeah, you once were. You are not any longer. So when we detect those fleshly tendencies in us, one of the things that we need to do as believers and I'm talking to you guys because you guys are right here. Mm -hmm. um, go over to chapter 9 here in 1 Corinthians. we need to do is 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 what is called crucify the flesh now that doesn't mean we actually stab ourselves we don't hang ourselves on a thing and nail our hands down that's not what we're doing what we're doing is we're putting to death a fleshly tendency maybe it's to gossip maybe our fleshly tendency is to talk about things we shouldn't talk about about other people's lives that's none of our business maybe our fleshly tendency is to be suspicious of everybody we don't trust people. Yeah, what the, one thing that that's not mine is bullying my brother. Bullying your brothers. Well, okay. So you need to crucify that. your fleshly tendency to be a bully to your brothers. And if I just go shoot that off the deck. Right? So, so we crucify that flesh. We put that fleshly tendency down. And we say, no, I'm not going to act like that. And every time it comes up, we say, no. Sometimes if you say it out loud, like maybe maybe you have a tendency to lie. And you're just, you know, I've known people, believers in the church, and they lie. Bull-faced lies. You catch yourself and you know this, and I need to curb this in my flesh. This is not God. People of God are not liars. When it comes out your mouth and you you catch it because it's your it's a habit, correct yourself right then and there. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, no, that was a lie. That's not what happened at all. And state it correctly. Yep. Correct yourself. Your flesh gets really tired of being embarrassed very quickly. It doesn't because it's embarrassing for you to correct yourself in front of somebody. Yeah. It really is. Like like or maybe your fleshy tendency is to interrupt people when they're talking. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Please, go ahead. It doesn't take very long for you to break that habit in you. Mm -hmm. Right? Because it's, it's rude. 
it's prideful. When you're interrupting people, you're prideful because you think that what you're saying is more important than what they're saying. And pride is something we are supposed to put down, right? So here, um, I think I want to do this in the King James because this is just not, not cutting the mustard. All right, let me find it. It is in... Alright, so let's start in verse 24. It says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So, run that ye may obtain. Right? Run that you can actually win. Right? If I'm in a foot race with people, the whole goal is for me to cross the finish line first. Right? So, if we, 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 we've, we've all know, we know about the, the tortoise and the hare, the Aesop's fable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, so you got the tortoise and the hare, they have a race, and the hare thinks he's so much faster that the, there's no way in the world the tortoise could possibly beat him. So halfway through the race, the hare lays down, takes a nap, because, you know, that's sticking it to a turtle, man, I beat you and I took a nap in the middle, ha, 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 except that the, the hare fell asleep for a lot longer than he anticipated, and by the time he came to, the tortoise was almost all the way across the line. Right, and so he lost to the tortoise, which, you know, don't be prideful, don't be arrogant. Run with the intent to win. So if our race in the, is our life, we need to run in such a way that means that we want to win. Yeah. Which means that we're not going to take a break and take a nap. We're not going to take this little this little detour over here and go wallow and sit a little bit because, well, it's just fine. I can repent later. Nope. I'm running because I want to win. Okay. I want to run a straight race. I want to go clean through. Mm. I don't want to get hung up and possibly get stuck there to the point where I can't win because I have gotten my stuck self mm -hmm. stuck in a, a tar pit over there. Yeah. Or that I need help. People are gonna dra have to drag me out of there by my by my you know by the top of my hair, the hairs on the top of my head because I've got myself so stuck that I can't get out at all. Because sometimes people do that. They get themselves stuck in addiction. They get themselves stuck in bad relationships. When we honor God with our lives and we understand that our life is important and God put us here for a purpose and He intends for us to run this ways well. That means that we're going to have our eyes set on the goal line and yes. not on, oh, hey, look over there. Those guys seem to be having fun. How about I join them? Wow. Nope, that's a distraction. Nope, that's not something I need to be participating in because those that I need to be participating with are all running with me. They're on the same course I am. They're all running alongside me. Right? So if I'm encouraging, I ran cross country when I was in high school. So when you, my, my teammates, you would encourage them, keep going, you got it, you got it, keep running, keep going. Right? You encourage each other yeah. in the race. There's yeah. a scripture that says, you encourage one another while it's still called today. Oh, well, yeah. Kind of like, you get distracted by something in the middle of a race and there's a rock in front of you. And if you're not distracted by anything and you feel like, I shouldn't be looking at that, I should be looking at the track. You might fall over and lost the race. You might. You might. There's stuff that's in the way. The devil's trying to take you out. The devil doesn't want you to live a godly life. He doesn't want you to be successful. He wants to destroy you. There's a scripture that says that the thief cometh not, but for to kill, to steal, and to destroy. That's his goal. He hates your guts. He hates your guts because God loves you. So he hates you because you're God's person. And when you live for God, he wants to take you out so hard, he wants to destroy you because it's like he's sticking it to God then. Mm -hmm. It's like he's needling God. Ha, ha, ha. I made your son or daughter fall. <laughs> Look what they're doing now. <laughs> he's just a big, fat butthead. He's not very nice. He's a bully. And he's a bully. So run in such a way that you may obtain. Verse 25. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. The, this one, the New American Standard says, it says, exercises self-control in all things. 
which means that you're not going to go over to excess in anything. I'm not going to go into excess in my food, or my video games, or anything. I'm going to be temperate. I'm going to make a list for myself, and this is all I'm going to do. I'm only going to play this much video games, and then I'm done. And then I'm going to get my work done, and I'm going to spend time with God, and I'm going to go do the things that I know I need to do. Now, they do it. Now, these he's talking about people in the natural. Now, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. A crown that's going to perish because in the in the Olympics back then they gave people laurel crowns. It was a little a little wreath. Crown of like all these. Yeah, it was it was different 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 races or different things had different kinds, but often it was laurel, which which was a kind of uh, plant back then. So they have this little crown. And, ah, I'm the victor. So you're running for a crown. That's your goal. Your goal is you're running for the crown. They're running for one that's gonna die. Right? If I've got a crown of leaves, those leaves are not attached to the ground anymore, so they're going to dry up, right? They have no life in them any longer. So they're running for an, a corruptible crown, but we, an incorruptible, meaning that it's not going to pass away, it's not going to die, it's not going to get brittle and just flake away. Right? I therefore so run. Me, I run. This is Paul talking. Not as uncertainly. So fight I. Not as one that beateth the air. Have you seen, seen anybody shadow box? They don't have an opponent, but they're going. It's just like air guitar. Yeah, yeah, it's like air guitar, but they're fighting with nothing. Does fighting with nothing achieve anything? Not really. No, it may look cool to some people. But yeah. if I'm yeah, in really. actually in a fight, I want to have my fist connect with flesh. <laughs> right, like I'm going to beat you up. I'm not going to just be like, oh yes, I'm content to be to the air. It doesn't do much. It really doesn't exercise you. Even people that are in boxing, they don't beat the air. They beat at punching bags. They beat at the, you know, the punching bags and the big, the big, um, what's called? The big punching bag. And then the big the body bag. The fast bag. Yeah. Anyway, they punch at those. Why? Because then there's actually strengthening their muscles. They're actually toughening the skin on their, their hands and they're making their, their, the muscles in their hands stronger from actually doing stuff. The wrist strength and all of that. And they can practice their footwork because footwork is important in boxing. So they're practicing with something. But he says, I don't run. I don't fight as one who beats the air. I'm not shadow boxing in my faith. But I keep under my body, or I buffet my body. What does it mean to buffet something? Buffet means to. It means to hit something. It means if you if if a if a ship is being buffeted by waves, it means that it's getting hit on all sides by waves. Sometimes you have to be very strict with your flesh and go, no, you're not getting away with this. Come on. I'm not gonna let you. This is not okay. I can't act like this. I can't say things like that. I can't let unbelief pass through my lips. I can't let profane speech pass through my lips. No, I can't speak lies. That is dishonoring to God. What I do is I just bite the, I just bite the inside of my lips to keep them closed. Mm. Well, sometimes you could slap your hand over your mouth and run out of the room. I remember one particular situation. I was uh, I was in a situation where someone was being extremely irksome, and I was having a very 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 difficult time. And they were they were somebody who who liked to tease a lot, and I can only handle so much teasing, especially at that point in time because my stepdad was a merciless teaser and he was mean when he teased. And so I, I don't deal I, at that point. I did not deal with teasing well, and this person was relentless and would never let up and it was like an inappropriate situation to tease like if i'm teasing you and we're just you know hanging out and i'm you're teasing both, you if you're poking each other that's a different matter right but if we're working and we're at a job and we need to get stuff done and we're serious and we need to do this and you're teasing me constantly during i'm gonna get mad at you because right now is not the time right now we need to get stuff done and so this friend of mine was doing this and she she'd been doing it for days i mean like weeks and just there was a, a lot of stress and everything and the situation occurred and I was on the verge of blowing up and I'm like I need to I need to not be here I need to be not be here and I left the situation and I drove away and I went and prayed and repented for, before the Lord for wanting to you know you know everything but I dealt with it before it it, it got to the, the boiling point basically 
Sometimes that's what you've got to do. You need to take yourself to the back room. You need to give yourself a whooping. No, you don't get to act like this. This is not a godly way to act. No, you don't get to respond like that to them. I don't care how you feel. This is not godly. You don't get to act like that. Nope. I know I'm stressed out, but I don't get to go have a beer because God does not want me to drink. Nope. I'm not going to smoke that cigarette. I know I'm under a lot of pressure to smoke it because all my friends are smoking it. But nope. I know this is not pleasing to God, so I'm not going to do it. And then you get yourself out of that situation. And you... Buffet your body. Mm -hmm. You say no, and you're not nice to it when it is being very insistent. You have, you don't owe your flesh outlet. You don't owe your flesh relief. You don't owe your flesh that. You are a servant of the Lord. You owe God your allegiance. You owe God your obedience. And when he has given us specific instructions in his words, in his word, to behave a certain way, we do not have a right to behave in a way that is opposite. Now, what I do is I just shove my face on my pillow. Mm. Keep doing that over and over again. So he says, I keep under my body. I buffet my body and bring it into subjection. So he's talking like I, my spirit man, I keep my flesh under. I'm not going to give it what it wants. I'm not going to give it the room. Remember we talked about giving the Holy Ghost room mm -hmm. to move? I'm not going to give my flesh room. I'm not going to give it space. I'm not going to give it time. I'm going to get out of there. So do you remember the, the story of Joseph? Mm -hmm. Okay. So Joseph is in Potiphar's house. He's got a lot of favor with Potiphar because he's got uh, skills and he's keeping Potiphar's house running really well. And Potiphar just trusted him so implicitly that he didn't even pay any attention to any of it. All he knew was what was put in his hand. And just food the set was set in front of him. Joseph ran his entire house from top to bottom completely. And Potiphar wasn't bothered by it at all. He didn't have to do it. Well, Potiphar had a nasty wife. And she sees this young slave guy. And he's like, whoa, he was a... He was a buff guy. Look at you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so she tries to get him to come sleep with her. Do you know what he did? He left his clothes, which she had hold of, because back then they didn't wear clothes like us. They wore like more like a, a like a, a wrap, something that would wrap around you. They didn't have things the same. And she grabbed a hold of it, and he took off running with just his loincloth. He was running away in his skivvies. He took to, to his feet and he ran. He got out of there. He didn't look at the temptation and go, well, surely the Lord wants me to be strong, so I'm going to sit here while I'm being tempted and say no. No. You run. You run. Paul told Timothy, he, he said in Timothy, he says, flee fornication. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to fornicate when you're fleeing. It is not something that you're going to do. So if you are going to... Uh, be in, if you're in a situation where there's strong temptation, like maybe you go to somebody's house and they want to watch a movie you know you're not supposed to watch. I need to go home. I need to go home. I need to go home now. Yeah. And you contact mom and dad, we come get you. Or maybe you're at somebody's, you're hanging out with friends at a park and somebody pulls out, you know, cigarette. Yeah, hey, you want some? Get out of there. You can say no, but I just get out of there and be like, dude, I don't want to hang out with people that smoke. Smell, yes, I don't want to do this. You know, and you can influence people to not do stuff, but th oftentimes the best thing for you to do is just to get out of that situation. Um, Rick Renner was telling a story about a young guy who had fallen into sexual sin, and um, it was with his girlfriend, and um, he's, he, he's like, okay, well, where, where are you when this occurs? And he's like, well, we're in her apartment. He goes, well, why are you here? Well, because I want to prove to God how strong I am. It's like, no, that is not what you do. You stay away from situations like that. Yep. You don't go and put yourself in a very compromising situation to show God how strong you are. You steer clear of those situations because we know how weak our flesh is. Mm -hmm. When your flesh is weak, you don't go and try to prove to God how strong you are. That's stupid. Yeah, we're already in a situation. Be still. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So... My point here is we need to be aware of where our weaknesses are 
and we need to not give our weaknesses any space. I buffet my body and I bring it into subjection, lest by that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway or should be disqualified. When you run track and you're doing um, relay races, each team has to stay in their lane. If you don't stay in your lane, you're disqualified. It doesn't matter whether or not you cross the finish line first. If you don't stay in your lane, you're disqualified. Mm -hmm. There are things that God is asking of us, and it's all here in the Word of God. God is not so mean as to go, hey, <laughs> I've got all these rules and regulations. You figure out what they are. No, he wrote them in his word so that we would know what to do, right? Yeah. When we know the rules and the regulations and we follow them, that qualifies us to win. But when we decide that we know better than God, or that our opinion is more strong or valid or whatever than God's, and we choose to go and do something else, we could actually get to a place where we are disqualified from the very thing that we've been trying to get other people to come in on. We want to get other people born again. We want to preach the gospel to others. But we ourselves, because of our lives, because of compromising in our lives, compromising with our flesh, we disqualify ourselves from winning the race. We've crossed out of our lane. We've done something we shouldn't. So I'm not sitting here condemning anybody who has. There is repentance. There is forgiveness. But I, what I'm doing here with my kids in this room is I am admonishing you to not give your flesh any room. Don't give your flesh any room. Don't give, you know, like, well, my tendency is to be a troll. Don't give your flesh any room. My tendency is to fib. Don't give your flesh any room. We are new creatures in Christ, and our lives have to be conducted as such, as a new creature. That our flesh has already been dealt with, so let's not give our flesh room and allow it to put down roots and make our lives more difficult in the long run. It's a lot easier to quit a habit when you've just started than to try and quit a habit that you've been doing for 20 years. You know how hard it's been for Uncle Gene to quit smoking? Well, Uncle Gene started smoking when he was like 17 years old. Like he's, was it that young? He started smoking really young. And it's been really hard for him to smoke quit smoking the best way to not to quit smoking is to never start right so if we don't want these fleshly tendencies these sins to get a root in our lives and to cause problems in our lives the best way is to never start and that means you need to be aware that those sins are there that they're lurking that they're waiting for you let's go over to um genesis uh chapter three real quick I think it's four. No, it's four. There are some people, there's a certain cheat where it's like trading some sort of toy, and you have to get money. You get money from trading things. And there are some items. There was there was some girl who wanted to trade one of these, the second most expensive thing. And then I offered them all I had, which was actually a lot of stuff that was very expensive. And the airplane wasn't even hers, so she stole the entire thing of oh, all my stuff. And sometimes they just go grab it and then hit the button. Okay. So here God is talking to Cain, because Cain's man. Right? We had Cain and Abel come to the Lord. Abel brought a lamb. Four, chapter 4, Genesis chapter 4. Abel brought a lamb and the, and the firstlings of his flock, and he brought the fat. And Cain didn't do that. He brought vegetables old vegetables old vegetables god didn't tell you to bring vegetables in certain cases they were supposed to bring the produce of their land to the to the to the priests as as part of their offerings to the lord but in this case this was not that was not established and they were never told to bring vegetables they were told to bring lambs that was what god told adam adam told his kids and cain didn't do that cain brought old veggies He's mad. He's mad at Abel. He's really mad at God, but he's taking it out on Abel. And in verse 6, the, the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? What's your countenance? Your countenance, you like your defense. Your face. Your face. The look on your face. More yeah. 
Um, yeah, when, yeah, when, uh, when you, uh, you can usually tell when someone's angry, right? Because they've got an angry look on their face. They've got an angry countenance. Or you can tell when someone's happy or when someone's relieved, right? Their countenance has changed. So he says, how, why is your countenance fallen? Why are you down about the mouth? Why are you looking all grumpy? This is what God is saying to him. If you do well, right? If you go and you fix this and you do what you were asked to do, Will not your countenance be lifted up? Won't your face change if you go and do what I asked you to do in the first place? Won't there be joy in you when you go and you do what I've asked you to do? And if you don't do what I've asked you to do, this is what he said, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. One of the things that we as believers have to do is understand that sin is crouching at the door. It's looking for an opportunity, and we must not give it that. We must not give sin an opportunity, which means that we need to be very strict with ourselves. Yeah. And my tendency is to do this. Well, okay, I need to steer clear of opportunities yeah. for me to slip into that tendency. I need to steer clear of gossipy people because my tendency is to gossip. I need to steer clear of situations where I might be let, wanting to lie because my tendency is to lie. I need to steer clear of, you know, opportunities to drink because, yeah, I, I really like beer and I like the taste of it and I want to, you know, I want to drink. I, I need to steer clear of oppor like opportunities to, to, to do any of these things. When we know that sin is there and it's waiting for us. It's just looking looking for an opening. Remember we talked about we, we talked about Rick Renner. He's talked about Diabolos, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, the one of the names for the way Satan operates. Dia meaning through. All right, so you've got the diameter of a circle. There's a line that goes all the way through. You have your diaphragm right here. There's a muscle that goes all the way mm -hmm. through our body right here. You've got uh, a diagram, which would be a, 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 a cross section of some space, right? It cuts through dia and then follows. Follows means to throw. So the devil comes and he tries to find a sensitive spot, a, 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 a weak spot. And he's going to throw stuff at it and throw. And he's going to throw it and throw it and throw it throw it and throw it and throw it, trying to penetrate your mind, trying to penetrate because then he can widen the gap mm -hmm. and set up shop in your brain. Mm -hmm. That thing can begin be, to begin to be a stronghold in your mind. If we know that's the way the devil acts, we know that sin is lurking, it's crouching at the door looking for us for an opportunity, then we know how to act to set up defenses against such a thing, right? There's so much imagery in the Bible and the language about, you know, uh, warfare. And the, we're at war with the devil. We're at war with him. He's our enemy. And we need to not give him the space. We don't need to open a door, right? It's one thing if the devil, you know, breaks through a wall. But if you go and you open up the door, well, that's stupid. Why would you open the door to the enemy? Why would you go and be like, come on in, come sit up shop? That's stupid. You're asking to be defeated. So when we don't play around with the world, and we don't play around with sin, we are setting ourselves up to yeah. run our race well, to run our race, race to win. Right? So I want to see all of you succeed in life. I want you all to succeed as Christians, to, to live your lives fully on fire for Jesus for the entirety of your lives, never having to fall into sin, never having to fall into something that's going to make your lives hard because sin is hard. It says the wages of sin is death. It also says that the way of the transgressor is hard. Sin does not bring you blessing. It doesn't bring you ease in life. It doesn't bring benefits to you. It makes your life hard. It makes it harder than God ever intended for it to be. And if we honor God with our lives and we honor God with our speech, we honor God, we are basically saving ourselves a lot of trouble in the long run, even though it's a little difficult to say no all the time. Lock the door against the devil. Lock the door against the devil and put up your shields, right? In, in Ephesians chapter 6, it talks about the shield of faith. And then we also take the word of God, which is the sword of the spirit, mm -hmm. and we attack. Yes. We don't just put up shields. We attack. We can use the word of God. And we say no, just like Jesus did on the Mount of, 
on, on, uh, when when he was out in the in the in the wilderness, the devil came at him, hurled something at him, trying to break through. Jesus countered it with the word of God. Every time we have the word of God, and if you're really struggling with something, if something's really being like really tempting, 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 you can ask for help. Hey, can you pray with me? Mm -hmm. Do you have some scripture maybe that you can share with me about this? You know, and then that will give you just enough to fight. Because what, what, what happened at the end of Jesus countering the devil with the word of God? It says that he left him for a more opportune time. If you are successful in your fending off the attacks of the enemy, he gets tired of attacking and losing. He'll leave you alone. Mm -hmm. He'll come back a different way and try and come at a different angle. But you won that round. You won. And then the, then the pressure will be off. So I'm just encouraging you guys. Be on the alert. The devil, like a roaring lion, is prowling about, seeking for whom he may devour. If we live our lives in the word of God, we will make ourselves undevourable. We will place ourselves in a position where God, there's another scripture that says that God is seeking those for whom he may show himself strong. So we want to put ourselves into that position where God could show himself strong in our lives and the devil can't devour us because we are right in the middle of where God wants us to be. We've shut the doors, we've got our swords up, and our shields are up. We're, we're, not, we're, not, we're not vulnerable. We're not defenseless. We are formidable adversaries. And the devil is not going to find it easy to, to eat us. Right? He's not going to find it easy to devour us. Mm -hmm. He may try to come and bring those things, but he's going to find that he bit off more than he can chew. He's going to break his teeth on us. Right? You turn, you turn your body into a wall of steel. Mm. He cannot get to the inside. We do this through the word of God, though. Right, the the word the word is our, our shield and it's our sword it's our everything. So that's just that's that's what I have. Amen. Just encouraging you, be aware the devil's out there looking looking to make a mess of your life. Don't let him. Sometimes when I'm in my room, I just he starts going and I'm reading my Bible just randomly so I can stop doing that because I feel I'm like on I'm on the alert so I can figure out when that's going to come because that's just random it's not like you've heard you've heard rumors about a war coming in it's not that it's random it, and it's it's personal and it's often very quiet nobody else knows what you're even going through but god does and he's put weapons at your disposal to use so use them amen amen okay let's pray Father God, we just thank you for today, for your word. We thank you for opening your word to us and helping us to understand. Let this word go deep in our hearts, Father God, and make an impact on our lives so that we walk more closely with you. We walk in a way that is pleasing to you, Father God. And I just thank you for everyone who's watched this, Father God. I pray that this word was a blessing to them, that it ministered to them, Father God, and that, that it, it helps them to live a victorious Christian life. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.